Welcome again to our Bethlehem Sunday School Adult Bible Class, and uh, you can have your catechism in hand as we, uh, as, we, as we usually do. We're on the second article, which is on Jesus Christ. I've got my catechism of the Catholic Church sitting right here, so I'm ready to go. Um, notice this one's a little bigger than a uh, little bigger than, than ours, okay? So we got some reading to do today. We're going to be talking about the, the humiliation of Christ. And remember, again, we've already talked about kind of the basics of the second article, that he is our Redeemer, that he is our Redeemer. And last week we kind of talked about how uh, he is, Jesus is eternal in the second person of the Son. We're going to talk about his birth today, so we're going to have Christmas in May. Um, hopefully no snow. So if you're on, uh, we were on page 164 last week and following, um, we're going to be, let's go there to read the second article, and then I'll, I'll tell you where we're going next. So, on 164, reading the second article. What is the second article? And I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. What does this mean? I believe that Jesus Christ, true God, begotten of the Father from eternity, and also true man, born of the Virgin Mary, is my Lord, who has redeemed me a lost and condemned person, purchased and won me from all sins, from death and from the power of the devil, not with gold or silver, but with his holy precious blood and his innocent suffering and death, that I may be his own and live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness, just as he is risen from the dead, lives and reigns to all eternity. This is most certainly true. That first paragraph in Luther's explanation that Jesus is begotten of the Father from eternity, that's what we talked about last week, and this week that he is true man born of the Virgin Mary. So, we're going to talk about the virgin birth, and uh, I think it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting stuff, um, and, and it's good to recognize here is where uh, Jesus receives his human nature. It's why we, would, why we would call him humble, in the sense he receives something not his own. Um, I think we'll just get right into it. You can turn to page 168 in this 2017 catechism, but also if you just have if you just have your Bible, I want to be in Luke chapter 1. Luke 1. The only thing today I really want to talk about is the virgin birth and maybe the implications and offshoots of that. Now, I had my Catholic Catechism there, so we'll refer to that and maybe the difference um, with those, but we're going to talk about Jesus' conception, right? Jesus' conception. Let's uh, start off with a question. Um, uh, basic question. Where does the Son of God receive his humanity from? Where, where does basically Jesus get his humanity? You say it's from? Mary. Mary, yes. Okay. 
and we're going to read basically the passage where um, where Mary is given that information, right? So you're a young woman, knock, knock, who's at your door? Oh, it's Gabriel. He's telling you you're going to be the mother of God, and lo and behold, you'll be, you'll be pregnant like that. That would be a shocker. So that's what Mary's dealing with. And ultimately, I want us to think about um, what does this mean? What does this mean when it comes to Jesus and his personhood and the salvation that he gives? Because the point of this ultimately of studying the virgin birth or first century uh, marriage or um, those kinds of types of things, the point of this study is for us to know of Christ's real redemption that he has won for us. The real salvation he gives to us people. All right. So, if you have your Bibles, they, they give you Luke 1 in the catechism there. If you have your, if you have your Bibles, let's be in Luke 1, 26 to 38. It is the passage concerning um, the angel Gabriel visiting Mary. And anyone want to read all of those verses for me? In the, in the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. And Mary was greatly, greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You, you will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, who will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child of her old age, and she who is said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, May it be to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Okay, a lot of things there. Let's focus on a, a, few, a few parts of that. First, verse 28. Greetings, O highly favored one. And we'll also consider the, the portion of verse 35. The answer, how is this going to happen? The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And finally, um, the last verse there, verse 38. Let it be to me according to your word. So first, if you're looking in verse 28, what's the description of Mary given by the angel Gabriel? What kind of uh, person is she? She was a virgin. She's a virgin? She was highly favored. Highly favored or O oh, favored one. Part of the uh, part of the confusion here is this this favor includes um, grace. It's just really the word word grace. So you might also hear um, Mary full of grace, right? Um, that that can be kind of misleading. <clears throat> Our understanding of grace is a free, perfect, full, um, full gift of God, right? Whereas there's part of that there in Roman Catholic doctrine when you're talking about the Virgin Mary, but you're also, also talking about something that God endows you with in order to do something with. And we, we have a little bit of subtle disagreement there with our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. I mean, it's kind of like, of course, you know, if God gives you a smorgasbord, he doesn't want you to sit there and eat the whole thing. 
he would want you to share it with others, so that's fine. Uh, but usually when the Lutherans talk about grace, we're talking about, oh, God's gift of eternal life, right? Through Jesus, Ephesians 2 kind of grace is a lot of times what we normally think of. A lot of times when you're talking about earthly grace, and here in this case with Mary, Roman Catholics might differ a little bit and say, oh, this is something God has given me to do something with. And that's not necessarily wrong, but there's probably a different emphasis, and it does get a little off-kilter in the case of Mary. It, is, is this a correct definition of grace, undeserved love? Or yeah, that that's the classic Lutheran one, right? An un, undeserved uh, favor, right? So, undeserved, undeserved... So she... It, this be a true statement she full of grace she was full of undeserved love I mean that coming from God right the good thing that the Roman Catholics do is they recognize oh this is coming from God what could be misconstrued and mistaught is oh now we're, we're going to place the emphasis on what Mary does with it rather than always finding the emphasis in the work of the Holy Spirit which we're going to get to and really the work and the redemption of God, right? So I think it's almost like a, a, a ADHD a little bit. The attention shifts toward this woman, and the attention is placed a lot on her, versus let's keep the attention on God and what God does. So, yes? Okay, this verse, up until now, this is how I've always, always read it. Um, for God has found favor with you. And it says, for you have found favor with God. So God did the action. And I always thought, well, what did Mary do that God found favor? And why I read it that way, I don't know. But it, it you know, it does say, you have found favor with God. And it says the Lord is with you, right? So yeah. And I, I think we could all we could all to some degree find in this blessing toward Mary what we have all together as baptized believers. Right? So undeserved merit or undeserved love from God. Well, that's what we all have when we are baptized. Um, so why is Mary so special? Um, you know, I mean, you're saying it's from God, and yeah, I, I, I don't think we have disagreement at all from our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters. They're yeah. going to have to, but what they do in air is they over-explain. They explain things that aren't there. What I want to focus on is... is um, this title, what we don't want to do is uh, get so focused to be disagreeing with a false doctrine that we overcorrect and start bashing Mary or say, oh, she's not important, she means nothing. She is the mother of God. The Greek has, uh, the Greek has a, a particular a particular title for her. Sorry, those go the other way. But she continues to have this title, this mother of God title, and that is all that is always true. She's the only one that God favored in this way, that God saw and that God used to carry in her own flesh his own, his own son, his eternal son. She had eternity within her womb. Um, so we don't disagree there. She can then be mentioned in, in, in our prayers this way, not that we're praying to Mary, but that we are grateful for all that God has done through Mary, Similar to where you could pray, oh, Lord God, thank you for my parents who has given me life. Well, 
part of Mary is, uh, and you'll get this with Elizabeth, that she is eternally, all generations will call her blessed. So everyone will know of this, of this Mary. Everyone will consider her to be the vessel which God used to give, to give salvation to the world. So we've got two things that are at play that are very important. God, God's doing this wonderful gift, but we don't want to misappropriate our concentration or our prayers or our worship to a person when God's the one that's doing it. When we think of the, when we think of the creed, just think where we're at here, guys. We're confessing our faith in God, the Son. We're not confessing our faith in Pontius Pilate our faith in Mary, our faith in Joseph, in the, in the Magi, the, the wise men. We're confessing our faith in God. So that's what the church has always done. That's what the Lutherans continue to say is, this is part of the confession of faith, even in the early church. This is what Christians have always confessed about God. It's not a confession about, particularly or specifically about Mary. It's a confession of what God has done in all these ways. A uh, question from the comments. Um, is Mary the uh, mother of God, or is it more accurate to say that she is the mother of God incarnate, since God has no beginning and no end? Okay. So, is Mary the mother of God, or more accurate to say, is he's met Mary the mother of God incarnate? We would say Mary is not the mother of God the Father, Mary is not the mother of God, the Holy Spirit, but Mary is the mother of God, the Son, who we call Jesus. So the church has always called her the mother of God. She really is. Um, just, just, like, just like the catechism is going to go off on this. I don't think it's as biblical language-wise, but it's true. It will call Jesus our brother, and so in some sense you could call us brothers and sisters of God in that way, in that we share in Jesus' humanity. But it, I mean, we're, it's not wrong to say that Mary is the mother of God incarnate, but the church is trying to honor the truth here. Um, before Mary conceived in her womb, was she the mother of God? Well, I guess not. But since that time, we have recognized her as the mother of God. In the same way, we say God died on the cross. Jesus really died on the cross. And we say, we say in that sense, the, the, um, Jesus is fully God. Jesus is fully God. It's not like um, part of Jesus' divinity was still waiting in heaven and didn't die. Part of Jesus' divinity was in heaven and wasn't incarnate. No. Um, so, so we call her the mother of God. And it's okay, and that's not worshiping her. It's not equating her with God in any ways, and we distinguish that at other times. Um, what I... Uh, one of the reasons I... I like talking about this is um, because of because of Christmas. Because of Christmas, um, I uh, went through a period in my life where I couldn't stand Christmas, and it, and part of it is um, the stuff that normally gets the flack, probably from Christians. Oh, it's just become so commercialized, right? Like, the, it's all about buying gifts and money, and how can businesses capitalize on Christmas, you know? So, there, there was some of that, but it was also, for me, well, I'm a guy. I don't, I don't like decorating all this stuff, taking it all out, and then having to pack it back up a month, you know, in, in the next month. It's a lot of work for something that just seems so trivial. Um, even in my hyper-pietistic days, I was like, well, why don't we spend our time, like, doing more, instead of, like, just decorating and, and giving ourselves gifts, 
and doing a gift swap with one person. Why don't we like actually spend our time helping people or praying more rather than all these what seem to be trivial like family celebrations. I know that, that makes me a bah humbug, but I'm just saying this is a period in my life, right? And what I was sort of missing behind the decorations and some of the Christmas carols and those family traditions, whatever you have, is for Christians, the root of that decoration and that celebration is the fact that God became man. So in our Christmas celebrations, even if it's, you know, um, distantly related of, you know, something like the holly or something like that, or Christmas trees, it's really hard to connect Christmas trees to Jesus. You know, Jesus wasn't sitting there with a pine tree right there and the, right next to the manger. <clears throat> so that, that's a lot broader of a relationship. But... When it comes down to your celebration of Christmas, when you think, why is Christmas so special? Really, the heart of it is the eternal God, from the comments, the eternal God has now assumed our nature and is one of us to redeem us, to redeem everything in your flesh and to raise it finally on the last day. I mean, this is life and death stuff. This is a huge thing that happened. And when you... what. What also helped turn my mind around to, oh gosh, Christmas is so trivial. What also helps turn my mind around to the foundation is a lot of our Christmas hymns. Read them. I mean, really, like, stop and think. Uh, what are we singing when we sing Hark the Herald? What, what are we, is it just we're putting a smile on our face and going caroling and we make each other feel good? No. The depth of the words of a lot of our Christmas hymns, their joy is rooted not in the gifts and the costumes and the decorations. The joy is rooted in the fact that God is with us in this miraculously way we can't understand. So how about we look at, how does that happen? That's Mary's question. How is this going to be that I'm going to be the mother of God? Verse 35, the angel answered her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. <clears throat> I asked you from the get-go, where does Jesus get his um, human nature? And you said, now, how does that happen? That's kind of Mary's question. How does God take someone's human nature and give it to his eternal son. Part of that's a mystery, yeah, part of that's a mystery that we can't understand. But, what, what's the answer? Who's at work doing that? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. Same word uh, used from the Greek Septuagint um, in, I think, Genesis 2. The Holy Spirit was hovering over the waters of creation. I thought all three of them were. So it's like, God, all three people of the Trinity, all three persons of the Trinity are present in creation, but it will specifically say the Holy Spirit has got this overshadowing thing. Okay, What is that? Is it hovering like a saucer? Like a, uh, a what are those, drone? Is that what the Holy Spirit's like? You know, God the Father's got a remote control flying the Holy Spirit everywhere? No. It's... Uh, it's, it's the presence and power and work of the Holy Spirit to do something specific. In creation, it was bringing forth life from the, from the Word of God. Here, in the Incarnation, it is assuming Mary's, assuming Mary's human essence and giving it into the Son. So this is how we avoid any crazy nonsense of um, any any crazy nonsense of like a relation, some kind of sex between God and man. That didn't happen. Mary's a virgin, and it's also how we understand and explain that Jesus has no sin. 
He takes Mary's humanness and gives it to Jesus without the sin. That's how it happens. The way our Roman Catholic brothers and sisters explain it is that, you know, he made Mary sinless. Mary is sinless. That's how Jesus has no sin, because something in Mary, right, this full of grace. Oh, she's full of grace. She must not have sin. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. Nowhere in the scriptures does it say that. So when you hear the Immaculate Conception, that's Mary's conception. Mary who was born without sin. Mary who's conceived without sin. Now, how does that happen? She has two human parents. And why, why does God then immaculately conceive her? There's no explanation there other than continually adding to the word of God and fabricating this. It's just not biblical or scriptural. What is biblical and scriptural is that Mary, who is a human being who needs Jesus as her Savior from sin, she has the Holy Spirit come upon her, and by the work of the Holy Spirit... Jesus dwells in her, Jesus without sin, Mary a sinner who needs salvation from Christ. If, 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 if you follow the Immaculate Conception, she, if she was conceived without sin, then, you know, in theory, how far back does that go? Yeah. Her parents and her parents and her you know. Well, that's why, that's why billion, they, billion years. That's why they call that the Immaculate <laughs> Conception. And they're, and they're trying to base that off of the Bible, when they say full of grace, they're saying, oh, see, here's the indication that it had to be Mary. Right? But you're, you're right. We're not, we're not trying to use reason as our, law, as, as our argument against the Immaculate Conception. We're using the Bible. right? We're trusting in the Word of God. And we're basically saying, uh, we don't understand this, but the Scripture says that Jesus is the one who is without sin says nothing ever that Mary is without sin. It says the opposite. It says she needed a Savior. Why do you need a Savior? In the Scripture, it's always from sin. It, How did this, is, is that uh, they believe that she is without sin, period, or just in the conception? Period. Because she may have been without sin in the conception, but everybody sinned. So how could that they possibly, she possibly be without sin. You, mean, you, can, you, can no get, you can get different teachings here. There are some Roman Catholics who say she is forever without sin. And you can have a lot more probably up until the time of her conception and birth, she was without sin. So from, so from her life, when she was conceived all the way until she's a young maiden, that she is completely, that she is without actual sin and without original sin because she had an immaculate conception. But the Bible says we're all are with all have sin. Yeah, you sound all like a sin. you sound like a so, Lutheran. <laughs> so, I mean, that's, that's, um, yes. That how did how did they how is the line defended? Um, and I rejoice in God, my Savior. And I haven't heard a good answer. To that. Okay, because it, it can you can you you can't justify it from the Bible. No, you can't justify that. I mean, you can justify that, but I meant you can't say, well, that isn't what it really means. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the problem is there's there is an over explaining of of how when Mary asks the question, how can this be? God says, right? The Holy Spirit will do it. And I think that Roman Catholicism answers that question another way. They, they're not okay with that. So then we're going to rest on the end of this passage. What is Mary going to say? All things are impossible. All things are possible with God. And Mary says, Behold, I'm a servant of the Lord. Let it be so. May it be to me as you have said. Let it be to me according to your word. Let it be to me according to your word. So it happens because God has said it, and he does it through his Holy Spirit. And that means, the big picture is not really Mary, 
we're just trying to answer that question, have that discussion. The big picture really is the emphasis on what lies in her womb is the Lord. Is the Lord. I mean, I tried to, to go back, I tried to, like, does that mean that the, if, if whatever vessel that carries God always has to be perfect, so does that mean that the tabernacle is some eternal piece of gold that carried God? Because God dwelt there in the tabernacle. No, that gold was destroyed by Babylon. It's not in some Indiana Jones movie, you know, that you want to, you know, go find in the Middle East the, the, um, the Ark of the Covenant. No. <clears throat> so, so if God dwelt in a house made by hands, in the tabernacle, in the temple, that wasn't perfect, he can certainly find the way to dwell in a human being who has sin, and yet still save us. So, so I just, I also don't think that it's consistent to say that Mary had to be without sin herself. And you're going to say something? Well, I was saying, a lot of these, the, the, the natural conception, the assumption of the Virgin Mary, the, 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 those, those just popped up over the centuries through edicts or whatever you want to call it by councils which is what Luther had said, and he's saying, I can't justify you know, these things because even councils and needies have, have disagreed, so you kept yeah. going back. Okay. Yeah, so our authority comes from the word of God, which is what Mary says, right? Let it be to me according to Pope Pius IV, right? No, let it be to me according to God's word. So Mary and us our authority is the word of God. Um, and, uh, and so that's not a, a Pope's edict. Very good. Very good. And, and that's helpful. And again, the emphasis here isn't on the mother. It's on God who makes her his mother. And what is God accomplishing here? <clears throat> a zygote, let's medical terms, a zygote is the single, single cell at conception. It is, it, it is the human being at conception. As soon as sperm and egg um, unite, there is all of a sudden something that's different. You've got something different that's living, that's active, that's moving, that's growing, that has DNA from mom and dad. Now, there's no DNA from God the Father other than his eternal essence of God the Son here. But that, that life is now in Mary, and that life with human essence, with your nature, that life will now grow and live and die on the cross for you and all mankind. I quote this a lot um, from... Um, from a church father, what God assumes, God redeems. So out of all creation, what did God take upon himself to save and redeem and give eternal life to? Humanity. People. Um, does that make you feel special? I mean, I mean maybe, but I, I just, I think that is profound. So at Christmas time, what are we celebrating? We're celebrating that out of everything in all creation, God became me to save me. To save me from my selfish sins and my pietistic ways. And, you know, I mean, that's who God saved. That's what's happening in the miracle of the conception in Mary. It's really cool. It's really amazing. And it's worth celebrating every year. I think that, I mean... That was my conclusion. Oh, these decorations that I put up, it's, it's not because the world has commercialized Christmas and I need to do what the world says. We Christians, we celebrate the incarnation. God became flesh. That's why we're putting up decorations. That's why we might give gifts to other people. That's why we have our parties and our food and our celebrations. It all comes back to God. Not Mary, not you, not the world. God. 
That's what we get to celebrate. So I've had kind of a rebirth of looking at Christmas and understanding whatever celebration we're doing, it's in remembrance that God has become me and saves me. And that is what the second article is all about. And that's what the incarnation is all about. Any other thoughts and questions there? I was just thinking that the conversations we've had here, there's, I don't know if it's just technical terms, it's, it's the discussion or, for, for instance, mother of God. Uh, most people would say she, she, Jesus was born through Mary. Uh, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And they're all God. If, in the Athanasian Creed, which we don't read often enough, I don't think I do myself, but when you're talking about what, when you talk about the Holy Spirit, you're talking about God. <coughs> when you're talking about Jesus, you're talking about God. You can't, they're, you can't separate them. They're co-eternal together. So, it's just semantics to me when we talk about stuff like that. Oh, okay. Theology is very particular about right. about what we what we say. <clears throat> so a lot of thought went behind that title and what we're confessing in it. <clears throat> so yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I think the Athanasian Creed might help clear up my language, my unclarity in the way I say that because <clears throat> it'll have this unity of the Godhead. Father, Son, Holy Spirit is uncreated, uncreated, uncreated. Not three uncreated, but one uncreated. But then it will get into the second second half of the Athanasian Creed will get into the peculiarity of the second person of the Trinity and what he specifically did. Um, and I think that might that language might help us a little bit sort that out, where my language right now is a little in, imperfect or unexact. Okay? Excellent. Yep. Okay. So, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Okay. So, I always read that as, um, obviously, the Holy Spirit there, and I thought the Father overshadowed both of them. Okay. Now, that... I guess it, it doesn't much matter how how it's done. It's so. What do you what do you mean by the Father overshadowing both? Well, the Most High. I figure that's the Father. Okay. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. I I I I would make that the Holy Spirit. And in Jewish, in Jewish, well, you know, it could go either way, I suppose, with the um, with the poetry argument. But a lot of times in the Psalms and in the Prophets, you basically say one thing and then say something very similar to help clarify and further that thought. And so, I, when it's giving you the Holy Spirit, I think then it's giving you another title or instance of the Holy Spirit. There. So I would say that's that's the Holy Spirit he's talking about. Um, okay. Well, this is all going to um, continue with the humiliation of Christ, who will die for our sins but live forever, and we have eternal life. Um, let's close with prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your conception in Mary. Some of these things we can't explain, but you have accomplished all of it for the salvation of us. What is impossible with us, you make possible by your love and your grace for us. Continue to help us read and study and talk about the work that you have done through your Son that grants us eternal life and bless us in our study and our questions, all to be guided by your word. When we consider our own salvation, let it be to us according to your word. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It was cool to have a question on Facebook.